Newton's first law of motion. We said earlier that Newton's first law of motion was based on Galileo's theory of inertia. And it states that an object moves with a velocity that is constant in magnitude and in direction unless acted on by a non-zero net force. Basically, an object is at rest and will remain at rest, or in motion and will remain with that motion unless a force acts on it. Now, this seems like a very specific case, but in fact, if we think about the world around us, most things aren't moving. So, most objects are going to obey Newton's first law. Um, again, let's be very uh, clear as to what this is saying. It's not that no forces would be acting on an object. It's saying that the net force acting on an object, all the forces adding up, will be zero for Newton's first law to be satisfied. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. So if you have zero velocity at the beginning, you have zero velocity at the end. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. If you have some initial velocity, that will be your final velocity. Unless a net, net means total, unbalanced force, okay? Net unbalanced means that there is a, you know, you add up all the forces and you have a little left extra, it's not equal to zero, uh, acts on the object. So again, a force is any push or pull, and net again means total. Take, for instance, any building. We call the condition where an object obeys Newton's first law, mechanical equilibrium. Okay? Equilibrium means everything's balanced. In this particular case, every single force that acts on an object will be equal to zero. A building, for instance, here's the Empire State Building, most of the force that acts on it is its weight. So, for a civil engineer who's designing a building, most of their concern is to create massive supports that as gravity pulls down, the supports are going to be able to produce enough upward force to prevent the building from falling. Okay? So the first thing that you're concerned about is your largest force, the force due to gravity. In designing this, you want the force up to be equal and opposite to any force, not just the, the weight of the building, but any force um, due to additional weight that may be acting on the building. Okay? So typically what an engineer will do is actually make it stronger against the downward force than necessarily the calculated downward force that it would have. Also, you have to consider wind load. What about wind pushing on the side of the building? If all your supports are simply pushing up and there's no force going to the side, this building is going to be toppled. So the connecting structures, the lateral structures here, also have to be able to take up some force. And the wind load can be quite significant, especially if you consider that we've had hurricanes up in New York City. Think about Sandy. Um, so as you go higher and higher in altitude, you also know that the wind is going to be stronger and stronger. So probably the way we'd want to engineer these buildings is to be able to sustain winds at least up to the maximum theoretical that we think could exist for that location, maybe 150, maybe 200 miles per hour. We also want to be uh, concerned about other uh, forces such as seismic forces that are going to cause the building to go back and forth so, um, you know, all of these are, uh, you know, considered when we, we want to make uh, any supports um, against the, you know, anything that happens here. All right. So, civil engineering. Civil engineering, you're basically building massive civil projects. They might be buildings. They might be bridges. They might be roadways. They might be dams. And all of these structures we're basically going to keep them stationary, okay? So the civil engineer will design each of these structures such that any external force that acts on this, be it gravity, be it wind, be it seismic forces, be it water forces, any external forces will be taken up by any of the internal supports of these structures. Remember, all forces have to add up to be equal to zero, otherwise these objects won't stay stationary. Here's a good example of a pretty impressive engineering feat. This was done by Roebling um, building the Brooklyn Bridge. 
And up until this point, most bridges were arches where the uh, bridge would be built mainly out of stone, and stone takes up compressive forces very easily. Uh, but the, the problem with this is we need to span this river and not interfere with um, water traffic, not interfere with uh, boats. So Roebling had to take his roadway high enough above the river, okay, and span a large enough distance um, such that there would be no interference and he couldn't have any supports in the river itself. So he came up with a very ingenious technique. At this point, Roebling owned a steel company and steel was becoming a more and more common uh, material for construction. So what he did is he engineered the roadway to sit between two towers, but instead of an arch supporting the weight of the roadway and turning that into a compression force, he suspended these uh, heavy cables, which had smaller cables down um, hanging from them, where gravity, the weight of the bridge would pull the road surface down, and the cables would create an equal and opposite tension uh, holding it upward. And again, um, this had to take into account wind load, okay, so there had to be some transverse support from, from the cables also. It had to take into account any seismic activity that might happen. In fact, the Brooklyn Bridge is a little bit deceiving. It looks like you've got these large stone towers, and then you have the cables coming off of them. The stone, in fact, is a facade. It's actually, these, these towers are primarily getting their strength from steel, and the stone's really just hanging off the, the end of them. So you have a very large tower built from steel, stone facade, uh, master cables which go from tower to tower, and then smaller cables that hang from that. So the weight of the bridge is supported by the smaller cables, the smaller cables are supported by the master cable, and um, basically whatever forces act on this, Roebling was able to design it in such a way that obviously it still stands pretty well today. One um, engineering device which has been very successful with the advent of steel, um, obviously wood's been around for a long time so it's, it's effective for wood too. Steel and wood do very well if you try to stretch them, they're very strong against tension and they're very strong against compression. Where they don't do well is if you bend them, okay? When you bend them they fail very, very easily. However, if you take wood or steel and you put it in a triangle, any time you try to bend one member, the other two members get tension or compression and will take the force off of the bending member. Basically, you can't take a triangle and change the, uh, the size of the sides, compress them or stretch them without changing the angle of each of the vertices, and this makes a triangular structure inherently strong, and the truss is based on triangular structures. Here's a tower. Notice that it's mostly open air. Okay? There's not a whole lot of steel in there for the entire volume that the tower takes up. Essentially, the strength comes from the truss structure, and it's very strong against uh, the weight of the tower, the weight of the cables that hang off of the tower, okay? And of course, the wind load is even low because the wind can blow right through it. Here is a Howe truss, which is used to support a railroad bridge. And again, the steel stru uh, structures aren't just designed in a, in, in a tri triangular form uh, you know, for aesthetics. They have a very functional uh, form where the Howe truss is essentially the least amount of steel that you can construct this truss out of and still support the load on the, the bridge that you want. And here you can see um, a number of roof trusses being placed on top of here. You can also use trusses for uh, floors. Um, just about any truss can be designed to span a particular space and have that uh, strong against any type of external forces. And again, if you look at this, when we put forces on a truss, um, all the members stay either under compression or tension, and none of them ever bend, and therefore it stays very, very strong. We take advantage of the maximum strength of both the wood and the steel. Here's some wood trusses.
which are used for uh, different buildings. Scissors truss gives you sort of a cathedral shaped ceiling, as, the, as does a vaulted parallel cord. Um, you can even have asymmetric types of trusses for uh, different spaces. Here's a, another asymmetric truss. Um, round roofs, that type of bowstring truss is very strong against compression. Um, here we can have space that you can store stuff in an attic, a gambrel type roof, um, Polynesian, okay, haven't seen too many roof lines like that, but you know, sometimes you might see that in a church or, or whatnot. But again, you can design just about any of these trusses to span whatever you know, distance that you need. Most of these are, are roof trusses. Um, let's see, here's a, here's some trusses that could be used in, in floors, you know, where you have a, a much thinner truss. In any case, the George Washington Bridge, obviously built after the Brooklyn Bridge, it doesn't have a stone facade. But the nice thing about this is, it employs all the same things that the Brooklyn Bridge does, except to reduce wind load, the towers are open, but we can clearly see that the towers themselves have those trusses in them uh, to keep them rigid, to keep them strong, to keep them um, able to act against any forces that might uh, go against the, this bridge. When we want to take a building down, sometimes the strength of the building becomes the impediment. Um, here is the kingdom that was taken down decades and decades ago, but it shows these uh, supportive ribs on the outside of the dome, which are, are I believe, made out of mostly steel, uh, but also are clad in concrete. Now, as long as this dome has all the supports in place, it's going to stay at rest. It's going to stay where it is. But when they wanted to take this dome down, they had all these buildings around it which couldn't be damaged. So, how are you going to take this down? Well, for most buildings, we can come in with an excavator or a wrecker and just you know, tear pieces off of it or use a wrecking ball. The problem is the size of the structure made it very, very difficult to employ any type of excavator or other type of device to uh, bring this down. You know, any excavator would be able to go up to maybe the, the second level uh, down here, and as it brought stuff down, the building would collapse on it. Demolition is not simply just blowing the building up. Because this building is so strong, we need to employ demolition techniques, but we can't just set a big bomb off of it and expect the whole thing to collapse and not have any damage. Again, you've got all these buildings around here. Each explosion produces its own shockwave. So what this demolition crew did is he put shape charges all along the ribs, but the shape charges were timed. The innermost rim would go first, and then progressively the explosives would cut outward along the radius of the dome. Now this is important because instead of one big blast, which is going to blow out all the windows in the surrounding buildings and a good part of the city, there are smaller blasts that have their own tiny shock wave. And as each pops off, it starts the center of the dome collapsing downward, pulling the rest of the dome with it as the other charges go off. Now these are shape charges, so they don't have a lot of explosives in them anyway. The shape charge has a chevron of metal. The explosives ignite behind the chevron. They invert the chevron into a jet of molten metal. They actually use copper because it's heavy. It doesn't have a very high melting point. And because of its inertia, it'll slice through reinforced concrete and steel, just like butter. And you can see as the dome was brought down, it was brought down uh, fairly... Um, with a fairly small uh, footprint, okay? Very little damage to surrounding buildings, and as the name implied, it imploded. It actually fell inward during the demolition. So again, this is about calculating Newton's first law, finding out where the forces are, and instead of setting the forces equal to zero, changing the forces to non-zero, but doing it in a very controlled fashion. Again, I've talked a lot about external and internal forces.
An external force is a force which is applied to something. It's an interaction that occurs between an object and its environment. So gravity would be an external force. Weight. Uh, wind load would be an external force. Seismic forces would be an external force. Okay? So these are all the different forces that might be acting on a particular building. The internal forces are from the object or originate within the object themselves. Okay? The internal forces don't really show up until the external forces act on the object. So for instance, the weight of the building pushes down on all the supports. The supports, when there's no weight, wouldn't apply any upward force, but as they are compressed, they react against the acting force. Same thing with the lateral forces against wind load or, or uh, seismic forces. Again, um, think about what Newton's first law says. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted on by a net force. The tendency for an object to continue its original motion is inertia. In the absence of a force, an object will keep doing what it's doing because of its inertia. If you try to change the motion of an object, the more inertia it has, the more mass it has, okay, the more difficult it will be to change. For instance, a golf ball versus a bowling ball. A golf ball, it's easy to change its motion. It's a light, low-mass object. But try to hit a bowling ball with a golf club, okay? <laughs> you won't get it changing its motion very much. Both resist the change in their motion, but the bowling ball requires a far larger force to experience as much of a change. Here's a good example of Newton's first law as a safety device. This is a seatbelt tensioner. And the way the seatbelt tensioner works is there's a spring-loaded ratchet that tries to um, coil up the seatbelt as it's not needed. So basically, you put your seatbelt on, it coils back, and it adjusts and has, you know, a nominal force acting on it. However, if you suddenly come to a stop, this block right here, which has inertia, will slide forward, engage a rod into this ratchet, and lock the ratchet in place. You ever get that seatbelt stuck and you can't pull forward? That's what's happening right here. You slow down, you're not going to be able to change the tension in your seatbelt because it's locked. And again, in terms of inertia, mass is the measure of inertia. How many kilograms? It's a scalar quantity. Um, in the US customary units, I think they call them slugs. Pounds are not the same thing. Pounds is a force. Newtons are a force. Kilograms, they're mass. Okay? So again, the SI unit for mass is the kilogram. The SI unit for acceleration is the meter per second squared. We will see that the Newton represents the unit of force for uh, the SI unit. And nobody uses a slug. Acceleration is feet per second in the US customary. And for force, it's the pound.